Welcome to section six, introductory analysis. In this section, we're going to take a look at DNS analysis, which is resolving domain addresses into IP addresses, ARP analysis, which is resolving IP addresses to MAC addresses, IPv4 and v6 analysis, and some ICMP analysis and how it's useful to you. Welcome to the video of DNS analysis. In this video, we're going to take a look at how DNS works from a basic level and how do common issues with DNS look like in a Wireshark capture. What I'm going to do here first is flush my DNS cache on this computer, which will clear out any of the cached entries on this device so that if I try to resolve any of them, it will have to go get a new resolution from the servers out there on the internet. We can do that with ipconfig space slash flush DNS. Now that that's cleared out, let's do a standard resolution. Now that we've cleared things out, and before we do a resolution here, what DNS does is it resolves domain names and different records of those domain names to IP addresses. That's really its primary purpose here. It's used for all sorts of things. Browsing the internet in any sort of fashion, the World Wide Web, if you're trying to resolve FTP servers, game servers, trying to run Active Directory on a domain internal into a, a local network, trying to run VMware, all sorts of different services out there use DNS. And there's a common mantra in IT that even when you think it's not DNS, it's usually DNS whenever there's a problem. So let's take a look at what a normal DNS resolution looks like. So what we can do is type NSLOOKUP in Windows here. We'll do a space and select a domain to resolve. So we'll use wireshark.org and I'm going to force this to go out to Google. 8.8.8.8 is the Google DNS server. So we're going to force that query to go out to Google directly. If I push enter, there we go. So in this result you see that we have the server that responded to our query 8.8.8.8 and that's its DNS name for that server address and these are the answers that it has for that device for that server. And you can see that we have both IPv6 and IPv4 addresses. The IPv6 addresses you can see have a very different format from IPv4. If you're unfamiliar with IPv6, take a look at other courses that are available from PAC Publishing regarding IPv6. So what we want to do is take a look at this from a packet level. So I'm going to flush my DNS cache again and we're going to start a capture on my local interface. Now that that capture is running, let's go ahead and we'll do the same command as before. Do nslookup wireshark.org 8.8.8.8. Push enter and we will stop this capture. So let's scroll down and you can see there's a whole bunch of DNS here as well as some other protocols. So what we'll do is we'll use a filter and to simply type in DNS in the display filter that will get rid of any other junk that we don't want to see. And what we'll do is look down here. Here's my first request. So we have some other DNS requests that occurred by my system uh, above here. We can ignore this one. And we're going to take a look at this first query here. You can see in this query, it's actually asking for 8.8.8.8. And so it's actually asking for the domain name of the domain server. And you can see it has a transaction ID of 1. If we look at the next query that happened, wireshark.org, you see that it has a transaction ID of 2. If we look at the packets in response to this query, they will have a matching transaction ID. We can see up here in packet 34, which is the response to the query on packet 33, that it also has the same transaction ID as the query. This is how you can match up the queries to the responses. And so a good example as to why this is useful is if you see a number of responses or queries even that are going around on your network and showing up in your packet capture with the same transaction ID over and over again, you may have a loop in your network. So that could point to a problem with spanning tree, for example. It's also just useful in general for us to be able to determine which ones are matched up from query to response. And you can see Wireshark as you mentioned before in previous videos, automatically is showing us that here's a related packet between the two. And we also have a line here that tells us 
within the DNS section of the packet details that it's a response has a response on packet 34. And if we double click, it'll take us there. And then of course you can go back and forth between the two. So transaction ID is very useful. Let's go down to our second query for the actual wireshark.org and let's open up the flags. We can see that there's a flag turned on here. We have a one bit enabled where it says recursion desired do query recursively. This means that the query is requesting from the server that it ask other servers if it doesn't happen to know the answer to our query. So a DNS server could have additional pointers configured in it or additional forwarders set up on it to go look for the answer to a DNS query. So this query flag is saying, yes, please do that for us. So let's go down to packet 39 where my system requests from Google the Wireshark.org A record. And we can see the response on packet 40. And we dig into the flags here and it says this is a response. Bit 1 is enabled, so this is a response message. It has recursion desired is enabled, sure, and recursion available, yes, I can do recursion. We scroll down and we see that we have answer RRs too. So we have two responses to this. Here's our query. And we'll go down to answers and we see that we have two records for Wireshark.org. So it looks like Wireshark.org is using some sort of load balancing system. Because we have an A record of 104.25.11.6 and 104.25.10.6. So if you go to Wireshark.org, it will take you to either of these two addresses. You also see that there's a time to live value. We have a TTL of 169. And the 169 is the number of seconds that this record is to be kept on my system before it requests a new record. So the TTL value is very short here. And most likely this is something to do with the fact that they are using a load balancer. And if there's any sort of change in the address, it wants us to get an update as quickly as possible. So it doesn't want us to keep a cached version of bad IP addresses for a very long period of time. For example, many defaults are 8 hours or 24 hours. So converted to seconds, you might see 86,400 seconds or so. Let's take a look at a DNS request that will fail. What we'll do is we'll create some sort of random domain here. Put in some gibberish.com. And I'm going to start a new capture. Go ahead and push enter. There's our answer, and we'll stop the capture. We can see we have the requests like before. We're looking for the 8888 uh, domain name. We have a dot home here, which we can skip past. And here's our actual request. And just like with Wireshark.org, you can see that we received, I don't know if you noticed this in the last one, we've received an A record as well as a quad A record. And that's because my system is requesting both IPv4 and IPv6. You saw that in the command line output when I did Wireshark.org. So we have an A record, which is the IPv4, and a quad A record, which is IPv6. But you see here that we have some sort of gibberish domain name, which obviously responded back in that command line saying that it couldn't find a result. So I sent out a query asking for 45yt blah 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 dot com and I received a response from the DNS servers at Google saying no such name. If we go up here and take a look we have messages or response, no such name, reply code, no such name. And if you remember from the filtering videos we can right click on this and we can apply a filter based on this selection. So what I just did there was I filtered our display filter based on no such name as the error code in DNS. This is a great filter you could apply if you're doing a packet capture where there's some sort of connectivity problem. You could look for failed DNS queries. In this video you learned a little bit of basics on DNS and some DNS query examples. Next video is ARP analysis. We will be resolving some IP addresses to MAC addresses for layer 2.